We're going to get right into the Word of God because we got a busy, busy night. Amen. Aren't you glad that Jesus has been turned loose on the earth? Amen. Uh, they talk about the devil walking up and down in the earth. Well, how about Jesus walking up and down in the midst of his church? Amen. Praise God for the blessings of the Lord. We're on the winning side. Amen. Now, I've seen some folks that look like losers, but if they're trusting Jesus, they won't be a loser. Amen. I want you to open up your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Matthew. Last chapter of the book of Matthew, chapter 28, beginning with the 20, with the verse 18. Chapter 28 and verse 18. We're going to read down to the rest of this chapter, the close of the book. It closes with a big amen. Let's stand for the reading of God's word, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And everybody says, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. I want to use for a subject tonight, our great commission. Our great commission. When Jesus Christ came, his mission was to take down the devil, and he did so. When he came, his mission was to pay for our sins, and that has been done. To purge sins from the planet, and that is being done by the mighty word and anointing of Jesus Christ. To give to us the word of God, and he did. And to take out the graveyard, and thank God after Jesus dying, he busted out of the grave and took out the power of the graveyard. Because of that, Jesus Christ gets ready to leave this planet and go sit down beside his father. And now he's going to make intercession for you and I. But before he leaves, he gives us a commission, a great commission. The Bible, many Bible scholars say that this is the great commission. Well, I think it's our commission. I believe that it's what God has called us to do. And I'm glad that we serve the living God. Amen. Jesus Christ. Notice he says in, in the word, as he got ready to leave, he said, all power. Everybody say all power. Well, you know, all power means there's not anything left for anybody else except when Jesus delegates that to us. So if Jesus has all the power and he delegated that power to us, where does the devil get his? Well, he steals it. He deceives people. He lies. He, he connives and he blinds people's eyes and he robs and the Bible says, I may know a thief don't have anything except yours. Hello? A thief don't have a thing except yours. A thief takes what you have because he don't have it. And Jesus Christ said in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life. And Jesus was speaking about the devil. He's a thief. He's a, he's a robber. He's a destroyer. He is uh, one that the Satan comes and he tries to pull uh, everything apart in our life. Let me say this right now. If you're living a defeated life, it's because you let the devil do it. Now, maybe you were ignorant of it and didn't know what you were doing. Maybe you just didn't have the knowledge that God wanted to give to you. And because of that, we plead the fifth on that and plead silence on that because maybe you didn't know what to do. But Jesus Christ said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Well, who gave him that power? Well, the Father God gave Jesus that power. And not only did he get that power through give, uh, be, uh, given to him through his Father, but that power was taken away from the devil who had stole it prior. And Jesus came and made a show of the devil openly and took back that which belonged to you and I. And Jesus took sin away, he took death away, and he brought to us eternal life. And so all power was given to Jesus Christ in heaven and earth. He destroyed the power of the graveyard, Jesus did, 
and he destroyed the power of sin, Jesus did, and he destroyed the power of Satan, Jesus did. And after all, what Satan had, he stole and robbed and pilfered the land to get what he had. And today he still deceives people and still tries to uh, con and deceive and disrupt people's lives through, through lies and deception. But how many know, you know the truth and the truth makes you free. Amen. Amen. I'm a made free creature right now. I mean, in this room are a made free creature. I've been made free by the blood of the lamb. I'm free from sin and death. I'm free from the graveyard. I'm free from the powers that be. I'm free by the power of God. And I'm trusting Jesus. You say, well, what makes you so special? I'm not special. You're not special. But Jesus is. Amen. And I'm not here to toot my horn. I've been around a lot of preachers that toot their horn and they believe in that beatitude, blessed is he that tooteth his own horn, lets it go untooted. And I don't, you know, I'm not here to toot my horn, but I am here to sound the trumpet for Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, before he left, he gave us a commission, a commission. And I want you to think about what commission means when you look at that, and the Bible says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. So Jesus took that power and delegated that power to you and I. Are you listening? Let me explain something about a police officer. A police officer, and Josh knows what I'm talking about because he uh, used to work in law enforcement. Maybe somebody else here has too. You don't have any power until that council, that judge, that county, those authorities give you that authority. And when they give you that authority and that badge which represents authority, then you have authority because somebody gave you that authority. And they are commissioned in the county or the state or wherever they are to do the work that a police officer does or state trooper or whatever the case may be. They're commissioned to do that. Well, Jesus gave us a commission. And it comes from the highest court of the universe, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we are given a commission. We're given a job to do. And let me explain to you the definition of commission. It means to a task, a duty, authorized with authority, official agents. We have become official agents of God. And God has given us the official authority through the name of Jesus Christ and through the word of God, we've been given the commission to go and preach the gospel and teach the gospel to all nations and to share the good news of Christ. This may surprise you, but being born again was good for you. But going out there in the commission of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and telling others about Christ is good for them. And we're glad you're, we're glad you're saved and we're glad you're a born again child of God and that's good for you. I say good for you. You come to Jesus Christ, got saved, good for you. Amen. But God wants you to be good for others. Amen. And so we want to be good for others. We want to share Christ. And it's not only a task, a duty, a responsibility, but it is an, it is an authority, an anointing that God's given us. I'm going to move rather quickly, but I want to show you the five times that, that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ gave us this great commission. Once of all, we are ambassadors for Christ. The Bible says that we are representing another country, a heavenly place. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ and for heaven. Before war breaks out, the kings and the leaders of a country who has ambassadors in other countries, before there's a war launched on that country, the king or the authorities of their country will call them home. And when they call them home, then they begin their attack. I want you to know that Jesus Christ is gonna call us home one day, and we're gonna be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we're gonna be called home, and then God will launch his judgment upon planet Earth. But until then, we have a great job to do, a great task to do. And the Bible says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now. It's one thing to stir up somebody and get them to come to an altar. It's another thing to teach them why they came to the altar. It's one thing to stir people up and say, whoo, had a great service last night. Mmm, God blessed. But you're still as dumb as you ever were. 
You feel good. I know this. I know it's Wednesday night, and you say, Preacher, you're so blunt. Yeah, I am, but that's just the way, that's just the way God made me. I was going to tell you, Mama made me that way, but she didn't. God made me that way. But we need to learn what we're talking about, amen? And people who do not know the gospel cannot really be an ambassador for Christ. The Bible says that we have the ministry of reconciliation. Well, what is reconciliation? Reconciliation is bringing those that are at odds with God to God. Reconciliation is bringing two groups of people or two people that are in odds with each other and strife with each other and bringing them together. Reconciliation. And our job is to bring people to God the Father through the person of Jesus Christ and bring reconciliation to be born again. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Meaning that God wants us to know what we're preaching about, and God wants us to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I've said this before, and let me say it again. You got one dog that'll bark in the neighborhood, and another dog barks, and then 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 the whole neighborhood's barking with dogs, but only one dog knows what they're barking about. And you and I need to know what we're talking about, amen. And so Jesus Christ said, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, representative of Jesus, died, rose again from the grave, and gives us eternal life, and seals us with the Spirit of God. Now the Bible says when you do that, you go into all the world and preach the gospel because Jesus has given you power. Look at verse um, Verse 19, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now notice the promise we have here. The promise of God's presence. There's a promise that God will be with us if we will take on the great commission. God promised to work with us, and God promised to be with us in our work, amen. The Bible says, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. I think that's pretty cool where it says Jesus, and I don't mean cool by cool, I just mean cool by awesome. And, uh, and I don't mean awesome just by awesome, I mean just right on, amen. And I don't mean right on by right on, but I mean, it's pretty excellent, pretty amazing. Amen, come on now. I'm preaching better than you're responding, I can tell you that right now. But notice he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The end of the world means, how many know there's going to be a lot of things between now and the end of the world? There's going to be storms between now and the end of the world. There's going to be famine between now and the end of the world. There's going to be upsets and turmoil between now and the end of the world. But Jesus Christ said, from now to the end of the world, I'll be with you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Isn't that good? Even to the end of the world. And I have to say amen to that. Right? Come on. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. I heard a preacher preacher one time, and he said, this shows you that no preacher or anybody should ride in an airplane because it says, lo, I am with you. <laughs> well, that's, that's not a good interpretation of the scripture, but he, I guess he was trying to, back up his fear of riding planes. But <laughs> low means behold, I am with you always even to the end of the world. I love that, don't you? Yeah. Now, here's the promise of his presence. Anybody in this room ever been in a place where you just felt like God wasn't around? Just felt alone, just felt abandoned, just couldn't feel God, couldn't sense God? Well, that's what you got a Bible for. Yeah. Amen? Amen? When I'm taking a trip to California or wherever, now I can go to California blindfolded and, and know my way there without even looking at a map. But used to when I'd try, if I were to go out east in Pennsylvania and happen that way, I'd need a map. They've got, I mean, they've got, man, they've got roads going everywhere. It looks like an Asian road map. I mean, it's, it's, it's busy. And so when I'm going, I need to stay focused so that I know which way I'm going. Now, I may be lost as a goose in a snowstorm and not know where I'm going, but I can get that map out, and I may not feel like I'm 
in, headed in the right direction. When I was traveling, Judy would use the map. Now they got that Google thing, whatever it is. What do they call it? Uh, yeah, some GPS. Is that what it's called, GPS? I heard a guy say one time, uh, is it a GPS? I don't remember what it is. Anyway, it's got a woman's voice. And I, and, I, and I put it like this. You used to have a woman telling you how to drive. And then you got a woman telling you to stop and get directions or giving you directions. Now you got a woman talking to you over an apparatus that says, what are you doing? Turn around. Turn right here. And, and my wife has t taken me places that I thought there ain't no way we're going to get where we're wanting to go on this road. But sure enough, Judy would follow that map and we would end up in the exact place we wanted to be. Amen? Did I feel like I was going to get there? No. And sometimes you don't feel like God's around you, but he is. Sometimes you don't know that you're going in the right direction, but God knows where he's leading you. He knows where he's taking you, amen? amen. And we had the promise of his presence here. I remember when I learned this truth as a young preacher. I, I was reading the scripture and I, and I heard another preacher preaching. He said, if you ever feel like God has abandoned you, if you ever feel like that you can't feel God and sense God, he said, get you a New Testament Bible and go out and knock on your neighbor's door. Knock on doors and invite people to church and tell them about Jesus Christ. And he went on to say in the message, and I was reading in the scriptures along with him, lo, I am with you always. Even to, Where did he promise that he'd be with us? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And so he promised if we'll go for him, he'll be with us. Isn't that beautiful? If we go for him, he'll be with us. Amen. That brings me to the next uh, scripture. It's found in the book of Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the book of Acts. In the book of Mark, we find the, the great commission, our commission again. Verse 15 through 18, we find his protection. Aren't you glad that God offers us protection? And in Mark 16, verse 15 and 18, and he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, why do you need protection? Creature. Hello? Now, I don't need, I don't need protection from a little kitty cat. But if a big old mountain lion comes out, creature. Right? I don't need protection from a little lizard. But when a big old timber rattler comes out, creature. I used to wonder what he meant by going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Till one day I knocked on a church, on a house door and a creature came to the door, not a person. Hello? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. A creature. A creature. Notice it says in verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, they shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he, received, he was received up into heaven uh, received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. Jesus did. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. So the Bible says that when they went forward, the Lord went with them, confirming the word. And they went forward preaching the word and confirming the word. And the Bible says that Jesus confirmed his word with signs following. Now let me tell you, friends, you don't get the sign and then the following. The following comes after you preach the word. The word of God produces the fruit. The word of God produces the results, amen. And so we preach the word of God. Beware of people that all they can talk about is miracle here and miracle there, miracle here and miracle there. Well, you know, I'm told that the Antichrist will show great signs and wonders through miracles. And so miracles don't prove a thing, but the word of God proves everything. Hello? 
Miracles don't prove a thing, but the word of God proves everything. I met a guy one time and said, I know I'm saved because I, 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 I almost died and, and I was floating in the air and I was in the clouds and, I, and, I, and, and the doctor declared me dead and I'm thinking, yeah, brain dead. But anyway, and he said, I'm going to heaven because I heard a voice say, you gotta go back. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's the word of God in that? Amen. 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 Where's the word of God in that? Yeah. Amen. And then you got people that say they went to hell and they had an interview with the devil and they went from cell to cell and people were burning like barbecue. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Someone said, when someone tells you living for God ain't no picnic, you can tell them going to hell ain't no barbecue either. Amen. And so we need to understand that people that say they went to hell. Well, my Bible says to Lazarus from Abraham, Abraham says to the rich man, when the rich man said, send Lazarus over to uh, bring water and cool my tongue, that's in Luke chapter 16, Abraham said, you can't come over here. There's a great golf fix between us. You can't come over here. And I can't go to you. So am I going to believe the word of God? Or am I, I'm going to believe someone that says they've been to hell, went through it and interviewed each one in hell and, and going to tell me all this stuff. Where's the word in that? I said, where's the word in that? Show me chapter and verse. Hello? Show me chapter and verse. Makes a good story, pulls people in. People have run to hear that. But where is the word in that? Come on. The Bible says that there's protection here. Go and preach the gospel to every creature. And when they went forth and preached the word, the Bible says that the Lord went with them, working with signs and miracles, confirming the word of God. But he also gave them a promise. If you drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt you. You shall take up serpents and, of course, he talks about new tongues, speak with new tongues. He talks about casting out devils in the name of Jesus Christ and all those things are real. Amen? I know some folks that need either the devil cast out of them or they need a beat out of them, one of the two, but I know some folks that need to get rid of a devil. Amen? Hello? But anyway, you know, I'm not here to talk about the tongues, speak with new tongues. Of course, I do that. I do that all the time, and I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. And, uh, uh, of course, we lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And, of course, we see people healed in the church. And I thank God for the laying on of hands and the believing God, because God does still heal. Amen. And God does fill people with the Spirit of God. And they do speak with new tongues and a, and a tongue of refreshing, a blessing of God. Amen. Thank God for all that. And there is miracles and there is great manifestations. But the promise is that he would protect us. And he said, if you drink any deadly thing, you shall take up serpents. And if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I want to address them two things. Drinking any deadly thing. That means you can drink a cup of coffee and survive. I'm looking at survivors all over this auditorium. Hello? I took a swig of it one time and it tasted so bad I thought it was gonna kill me. I said, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Now, you get mad at me, you're talking about my coffee, bless God. I might as well talk about your politics too, huh? Well, I'm not gonna go there because that's gonna get me in trouble. But he's not talking about coffee, he's not talking about pop, he's not talking about buttermilk, but he's talking about drinking poison. If someone says, I'm gonna get rid of that guy, he preaches too hard, I'm gonna sneak back there in the barbecue tonight, and I'm gonna pour poison in the pastor's drink. Well, the Bible says here that if they drink poison, any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Meaning, I'm not going to die till, I'm, till God's through with me. 
Now, if I died tonight, it meant God's through with me. But I'm not going to die until God's through with me. Amen? Hello? But if I know a glass has got poison in, I'm not going to drink it. And there are churches out there, listen to me, churches out there that actually drink poison because they believe this scripture and they drink it and they get a bellyache and they get sick and they throw up and they vomit and, and all that and, and, and they say, well, I didn't die. Well, that's ignorance gone to seed. <laughs> Amen? Come on. Hello. It's like the guy that had a garden full of watermelons and somebody kept coming out there and stealing the watermelons in the night. And what he did was he put a big sign in the watermelon patch that says one of these watermelons is poisoned. If you eat it, you'll die. They quit stealing watermelons because they didn't know which one was poisoned. Amen? Come on. Give you an idea, didn't they? <laughs> anyway, but, but you think about this and you think about uh, there are people that handle snakes. Our church has been accused of handling snakes. I said, I got worse than that. I've handled deacons before. I'm just teasing now. But they said, do you handle snakes? Anybody ever asked someone in this auditorium that went to Old for a are you that church that handles snakes? No, we're that church that chops snakes' heads off. Amen? Now, it's against the law to kill a snake. In the state of Missouri, it's against the law to kill a turtle, a snake, or a tree frog. It is a, against the law to kill a snake. But my wife don't know that. Hello. And my wife is a lawbreaker. Because she sees a snake, it's dead. The one said, no good snake, uh, the only good snake is a dead snake. Well, Shane's back there in the television room right now, and he's panicking. He broke out of a cold sweat. He's shaking all over. Snakes are his best friend. God bless you, Shane. Settle down. I'm just kidding. But I was watching on the uh, Internet, and they were actually handling snakes. And this preacher had this snake, and he was yelling in its ear. If a snake has an ear, yelling to snake. This is on Internet. And I'm going through the church page on Facebook, and this pops up on the church page. Not the actual church, but next to it. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, somebody's going to see that and think we're handling snakes. Let me say this. This verse isn't about handling snakes literally, and drinking poison. This verse is about having protection and being able to take on demon spirits, be able to stand in the powers of God. This verse is talking about going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature and seeing results, miracles. Amen. Come on now. All right, let's go to the next one, the gospel of Luke. The gospel of Luke. In, in Matthew, you have the promise of his presence, in Mark, you have the, his protection. And in Luke 24, verse 46 through 47, or actually 40, 45 through 47, in Luke, you have his program. How many know God has a program? Amen? God has a program. Verse 45, then opened he their understanding. That's Jesus opened up his uh, the, the sons on the disciples on the road to Emmaus, he opened them up their understanding. And the Bible says that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name among all nations beginning in Jerusalem. So here's God's program. God says, first, you've got to understand this. Understand that Christ suffered. Understand that Christ had to suffer. Understand that Christ shed his blood and suffered on the cross of Calvary. Understand that he raised again from the grave on the third day, and that because of that, repentance must come to people's lives, and if they repent of their sins, remission of sins is preached in the name of Jesus Christ. That's God's program. God's program is Jesus came, took your sin, took your death, 
took your hell, broke the powers of death, hell in the grave. Jesus went to the grave, went to the, uh, arose again from the grave, and Jesus Christ says now, stop your sinning. His program, God's program is, I paid to sin debt, I'll give you new life, I'll give you strength in your spirit, now stop sinning. Remission of sins. And in that name of Jesus Christ comes the remission of sins. Where do you start? In the beginning in Jerusalem and, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Where do we start? In Ozark, Selmar Road. And we expand out. John, St. John. And I'm about to wrap it up, but I want you to notice St. John, you have the promise of God's peace. The promise of God's peace. John chapter 20, verse 19. Peace be unto you. He says, peace be unto you as the Father sent me, even so send I you. Jesus appears to his disciples in the upper room. They've got the doors locked for fear of the Jews, and Jesus appears in his glorified body. He's resurrected. Verse 21 and Jesus said unto them, again, peace be unto you as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. Verse 22 and 23. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now, I want to point out something heavy. First, the disciples were in the upper room. They were hid because Jesus had died on the cross. And this was the third day that Jesus rose again from the grave, but the disciples didn't know that. And so Jesus Christ just appears in that room where they've got the doors locked for fear, for fear of the Jews. And there he just appears unto them, shows them his hands and his side. And the Bible says, then were the disciples glad. But Jesus Christ said to them, peace be unto you. As the Father sent me, even so send to you. There's the commission. As the Father sent me, even so send I you. Now they were afraid, but as they look at the wounded hands and the pierced side, and Jesus came out of the grave, kind of takes the fear out of them now. Courage fills their heart. I mean, oh, Jesus Christ makes courage fill your heart. Amen. Every Christian in this room, courage has filled your heart because Jesus did so much for us. All power is his. And so he breathes onto them and says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Jesus breathes upon them and says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he made this statement in verse 23. In verse 23, he says, after breathing upon them, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins they are retained, they are retained. Whatever sins you retain, they are retained. Now, some people believe that this is like Catholicism, that the priest can forgive you. That's not what this is teaching. The word remit there means, whosoever sins uh, ye remit, means to release or diminish, meaning to set someone free. But it isn't you and I that sets people free, it's Jesus. But it's the message that we bring of Christ that releases them and their sins are remitted. So the message that we bring has saving power. The message that we bring has forgiving power. Amen? So it's whatsoever sins you retain, they are retained. That word retain just simply means to stop. Whatever sins you stop. Now I mean, no, oh, preachers need to learn to preach in such a way that people in the church will stop sinning. Stop. People are too comfortable in their sin. Stop sinning. And the preaching must go forth. And the ministry must go forth. And the Bible says whatever sins you remit, they're remitted. Meaning you don't forgive, but you give them the message of forgiveness. And it is permanent. And whatever sins you retain, you stop something. And it is retained by the power of God. That's God's peace. And he promises peace. I mean, no, peace is one thing that if we're not careful can be robbed from us. Now, I don't mean the peace that's down deep in our spirit because that peace is given to us from God and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10, verse 12 and 13. And when you come into a house, salute it. Now, Jesus is sending two by two out to preach the gospel, the kingdom. 
And he says, when you come into a house, salute it. In other words, when you come into the house, be kind, be courteous, be gracious, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. Now, as simple as this, you go out and share Jesus Christ and someone just rips you up one side and down the other, then they're not worthy of the message that you're bringing them. But if you go into the house and preach the gospel and share Christ and they receive it, then they're, they're worthy and the peace is worthy to abide there. But if someone treats you very unkindly and very disrespectfully, the Bible says you're to leave that house and when you leave that house, you are to let the peace return to you. In other words, don't be bummed out because someone treats you bad. If someone treats you bad, the problem's theirs, not yours. Let me say that again. If someone treats you bad, the problem is theirs, not yours. So don't let them rob you of your peace. Let your peace return to you. And I've learned that over the years. Let the peace of God return to me. Amen? I've been in, I've been in situations where I just kind of, I remember this scripture and I say, come on back. Come on back. Hey, come back. Amen? I've laid in bed at times, worried and, and, and troubled. Anybody done that before? Laid in bed. And, and I just had to raise my hands up in the bed and go, come back. Need the peace back. Amen? And let the peace return to you. Amen? Come on now. And so that's in the book of John. The last one is in the promise of his power. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I want you to understand that if you're a prayerless person, you're a powerless person. And, it, and you need the Spirit of God to make you powerful. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. Now, why are you getting the power? Are you getting the power so you can shout and run the aisles? Are you getting the power so you can dance in the Spirit? I like being happy, and I love dancing in the Spirit. don't happen too often because other people can't stand the way I dance. But anyway, in the Spirit of God. But I've been drunk in the Holy Ghost. Anybody ever been drunk in the Holy Ghost? And some of you, you know, you're just drunk. But anyway, but, but I've been drunk in the Holy Ghost before. And so I believe in the, the great joy that the Spirit of God brings to us, but we're, we're given that power to be witnesses. Amen. Our job is to be a witness. And he said, you should be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and to Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the world. And then Jesus left. In verse 9, he wraps a cloud around him and takes off and goes to be with the Father. He just left. And he left us with the instruction, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I'm glad the power of God has come upon my life. And I'm thankful for the anointing of the Spirit of God. I never will forget one time I had a friend, Noel Forster was his name. I don't know why God led me to older preachers. When I was a young preacher, God led me to older preachers. Older preachers taught me how to conduct funerals. Older preachers taught me how to minister and do the Lord's Supper. Older preachers taught me. God led me to older preachers. And Noah Forster was a very old gentleman. He loved the Lord so much. And, I, and he would always say to me, Son, don't forget the Holy Ghost. Son, don't forget the Holy Ghost. And one day I was preaching um, west, west of here in a little country church. He was pastoring it. We had the windows up, the fans going. I had to yell loud to get my voice over the fans. It was hot. It was middle of summer. And I'm closing the service, got through preaching. And Noel started laughing uncontrollably. Spirit of God just come on him and he started laughing uncontrollably. I thought there's something wrong with this old man. Until he danced over where I was and he wrapped his arms around me and I started laughing just like him. And we were jumping up and down, laughing in the Holy Ghost 
Everybody was looking at us like this. And we were having a time. We laughed our crazy heads off. That was a refreshing. But it doesn't take the place of witnessing. That was a refreshing, but it doesn't take the place of power to witness and power to live clean for the Lord. And I thank God for the refreshing. I thank God for the blessings. I thank God for the, I can't believe I'm saying this, I thank God for the whoopings sometimes. You say, what's a whooping? If you don't know, you've never had a whooping then. Amen. My mama knew what a whooping was. My daddy knew what a whooping was. Esty Martin knew what a whooping was. Amen. Esty Martin wouldn't get a hold of mom and dad and say, is it okay if I spank your son? No, Esty Martin just grabbed a hold of us and waylay into us. She would. And wouldn't ask for, for permission. One day my brother Galen was getting out of hand and Esty Martin tied him to a tree. Now if you did that today, you'd go to jail. Hello. But I thank God that God has given me the childhood I had. I thank God that God has given me the leadership that he's given me. And, and I want to say to everybody in this room, if you don't have the power, get along with God till you got it. If you don't have the power to witness, get along with God till you get it. And follow the Lord's instruction and understand it isn't about you just being happy. It's about bringing others into that happy place with you. Is it isn't just about you having joy and having blessings? It's about bringing others into that place with you. It's our commission. It's our great commission. Our great commission is to bring others to Christ. Now, I'm happy to say Sunday morning we had one saved. Older gentleman caught me in the foyer and said, I got to talk to you. And afterwards, we went in Josh's office, and he sat there, and he said, I need to get cleaned up. I need to get saved and give my heart to the Lord. And he got born again right there in Josh's office. Someone saved by the power of God. I think there were others that needed to come Sunday morning. But, you know, I'm always thankful for the Spirit of God drawing people. But you'd be amazed how successful you can be outside the church. Amen? Amen? For the most part, the world's not going to come to church. Amen. The church has got to go to the world. Hello? For the most part, the lost world is not going to come to church. you got to go to them. Amen? And when you go to them, you have something to give them. You have something that will change their life. You have something that will spin their life around and give them joy. you just got to take that initiative to go. You say, well, I'm scared. Well, go in the promise of God's protection. Go in the promise of God's presence. You say, well, I'm just afraid to witness to big people. Well, find you a little person. <laughs> How little does it have to be? Can, did it have to be shorter than April? <laughs> How little did it have to be? I mean, if you have to, get you a tape measure and go out to the bedroom. Figure out, okay, I can witness to someone 30 inches tall. Then go around measuring them. He said, that's ridiculous. Yeah, and it's ridiculous for you to be afraid. Greater is he that's in you than he is in the world. Amen. And don't be afraid of rejection. Don't be afraid of rejection. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting Jesus Christ. And trust me, I've been rejected a lot. In fact, I've been ejected out of places. But I want to say to everybody in this room, Find a way to share Christ. You say, well, I don't know where to start. Do you pay electric bill? Anybody in here pay the electric bill? Anybody? Write a little note on Did you know that someone at the end of the mail that gets your payment puts in a computer that you paid the electric bill? And that person that gets your money probably is having trouble at home, probably needing a blessing, maybe a discouraged Christian, maybe a lost person. Just write a little short note with the bill. This little short note with the bill. Maybe just put something like I said Sunday morning. Um, the the most the, the strongest Christian 
uh, is a person that has been broken and rebuilt by God. Just write something like that. And just write a little note in there. God loves you and he's watching you. He cares about you. Just a little note. Amen? Hello? I did that one time, wrote a little note in the electric bill. Remember when the electric company Empire was down here by the square? And we'd, you, could go actually, you could actually go in there and pay your electric bill. And we paid it there at the church. And I wrote a little, wrote a little note and mailed the, 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 the bill. Well, I didn't mail it. Excuse me. I put it in the drop box at night. And I'd put a little note in there. You're going to make it. Don't give up. Jesus is your, your wonderful Savior. And I can't remember everything I said, but I was encouraging it. I went back there several months later to pay the bill in person because it was open. And I walked up there, and they, the lady at the desk said, you're Pastor Aikens. I said, yes, I am. She said, you just saved my life. And I said, how did I save your life? She said, it's been a few months ago, but you had sent a bill. She said, I guess it was you. It wasn't your secretary. She said, it looked like your sloppy handwriting. <laughs> and your name was on it. I said, yeah, it's me, thanks for the encouragement. And anyway, she says, that just encouraged me so much that it just changed my whole week, changed my whole atmosphere. And she thanked me for it. How many, how many of you know that a lot of people will never tell you that you blessed them, but God knows? Amen. said, God knows. Yeah. Amen. Amen? We're not going to hear from everybody that hears it on television. We're not going to get calls from everybody on television. We're not going to get letters from everybody on television. But I guarantee you, when we get to heaven, God knows everyone's ever been blessed through our telecast on television. God knows everybody's been blessed through your witness for Christ. And we need to find ways and work hard to extend that blessing to other people. Amen? Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. And we're going to have a time to have a cookout. In fact, they've already probably got the stuff ready to go. But before that, maybe there's someone that would like to come down here to an altar tonight and just say, Dear Jesus, I want you to give me more opportunity to share Christ. I want you to give me more thoughts and more um, ways and give me, give me more plans and more creativity to share Christ. Give me more opportunities. Maybe you'd like to pray that tonight. Maybe you'd like to just come and say, God, I need some strength and some courage. And maybe you're lost in this place and you'd like to come to this altar and say, I need to be saved. I need Jesus to wash my sins and cleanse me and release me from my sins. Would you come? The altar's open.